So go ahead and grab your Bible, if you would, and we're going to be in the book of Philippians, as you can see, uh, a series that we've entitled All Things New. And last week we looked at Paul has a new heart. We've been given a new heart, each of us who are believers, disciples of Jesus, been transformed by him. Today we're going to talk about a new purpose. Now I'm going to set this up, so let's take a moment to frame this today as we get then to Philippians uh, chapter 1, the latter part of that chapter. Uh, this past Wednesday night, um, we gathered, a bunch of us were in the Great Hall to put together baskets uh, or bags of food and boxes of resource and supplies for our partner uh, school, Jacklow Elementary, over in, in the Vickery area, where some 50 different countries are represented, maybe more depending on the semester, 25, 30 different uh, languages are being uh, spoken in the homes of kids in that school. And um, already Afghan kids are in that school. Others, I'm told, are coming uh, to one of the highest um, uh, dense uh, populations of immigrants or refugees, really, in, in uh, the United States. And so we've been able to serve them. And so it was a great day from the youngest to oldest among us uh, to be able to go and deliver lots of great supplies and, and help for them, resources. We're going to be there all year long serving and mentoring and praying with uh, those teachers there. So I got there a little early and I thought, what can I do? And, and I saw a couple of folks were over there making boxes. So they're flat, you know, and, and uh, so I thought this will be fun. I like, I like to build stuff. So I started to, you know, fold, you can go like this, then these go down and wait, that one comes down and then these go up. And then finally you got this real sturdy kind of file box. And I was about two or three of them in and, and and I, I was kind of fumbling around a little bit. And, and then I realized that on the box, um, right there were the instructions on how to build the box that I was holding, trying to build. Uh, now, Stacy is not surprised by that story, but I, I was like, oh, here we go. And so then I started busting out some boxes. But I thought later, I thought, what, what if life really was like that, just instructions. I have people say, Jeff, how do you hear from God? I want to hear from him. Um, there, there's a book for that. How do we hear from him? How do I know how I'm supposed to live this life? There's a book for that right in front of us. And I'm guessing you have a Bible. And I hope you have one today. Because this is our text always for this course. The Bible is the course. I mean, it is the source of our strength, source of instruction. You know, as a pastor, I have people ask me a lot in different forms, different ways. Um, the question really, in essence, is what is God's will for my life? I uh, met with, you know, a couple of members this week, just kind of process this. Help me pray with me. I'm trying to make a decision about this job or this relationship or this challenge that I'm facing. What is God's will for my life? And I always back up to say, let's frame this um, in a different way. What is God's will? That's the better question. The first one is about me and what I'm all about. And we tend to focus on ourselves, my purpose. The other is on God's purpose. What is God up to in the world? You know, I talk to young couples that are looking to get married and we'll talk for a while. Why do you want to be married? And well, do you want to be married because of this and this? And I always then frame it. Okay, there's a better question. Not why do you want to get married? But, but why, would, why marriage? Why would anybody get married? What's the purpose of marriage? And today what I want to talk about, you see, in our relationship with God, we've been given a new purpose and we've got to be clear about it. This message I'm praying will be so encouraging for you today. So encouraging as we focus our hearts and our minds on God's plan for us. Because this is where I know in my life, when I get off track, oh, that's what you're doing, I forgot. And it's the main thing that he's doing. And I want you to hear this from the start. God's plan is still the plan. His first plan is still the plan to make us in his image. All the way back to Genesis, he creates the first man, Adam, one with him, in communion with him, walking with him, perfect relationship with him, God's sovereign over him. He's accomplishing God's will for him. And in that sovereignty, in his submission to God, he finds freedom, full freedom, and he's living in it. And then, of course, 
the fall takes place, Adam turns to his own purpose. Adam and Eve, our, our father and mother, now we too have chosen our own way. We've turned away from the source of life. We're dead in our sin. But as disciples of Jesus, if you have received Christ, if you've received his grace, his forgiveness, your hope is no longer in the first Adam, but now in what Paul calls the last Adam, the first man fallen in sin, the last man, Jesus, comes to restore us and this broken world that we live in, even creation itself. Broken, fallen, and all of creation. We sense it, don't we, in these days? Groaning for it. Groaning for change in ways deeper than we can express. This virus continued to run rampant or through the past year and a half throughout the world. The horrific stories coming out of Afghanistan, Haiti, it's, it's overwhelming. This, this backdrop that we find ourselves living in and I'm seeing it in, in a lot of us. I sense it in myself. Just a real undercurrent of a weight that can come out in frustration or in our relationships. And I want to acknowledge that today. This brokenness even that's within us. Not just without. But within of anxiety and worry and tension in our relationships. But I want you to be encouraged today. God's original plan will not be thwarted. God's purpose for us all. His plan to make us into his image. Because our hope, you see, is not in the last Adam. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Look at this as I continue to set this up. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, Adam, man of death, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Christ comes and gives us life. He brings a new purpose. Paul puts it this way in Philippians 1, 6. We saw this last week. Let's all say this together. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He began a good work and he's faithful to complete it. He's going to finish what he started in you and in me. What has he started? What is this thing? And what does it look like in completion? Well, it looks like Jesus. Everything is moving towards this one purpose. 2 Corinthians 4.11 says this. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. He's saying we're constantly dying to ourselves. We're constantly, yes, even physically we feel it, we know it. But as painful as this is, this is a really good thing. If our goal is to be like Jesus. So what is our new purpose? What is this new purpose? Simply put, to be conformed into the image of Christ. And friends, listen, if we can keep this in our minds... If we can settle on this every day, every minute of every day, you will face trials, tribulations, challenges in your life, circumstances that come your way that you cannot control. You will face them completely different. As we will see, Paul gives us an example for us to follow, and it's why it's in God's word. Paul has a new purpose, and his purpose is to be conformed into the image of Christ. And he got this from Jesus himself. Luke 9, 23 says, if anyone come after me, friend, let me ask you, do you want to be a disciple of Jesus? If anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, die and follow me. This is what separates those who claim to be Christian from those who are disciples of Jesus. Following in the way of our rabbi, he says, follow me. We pursue him. We have a new purpose. And today I want you to see, because of this new purpose, I can shine with courage, all right? I can stay put with conviction. I can strive and even thrive in community. And I can, surprisingly, suffer with confidence. I want this word to be an encouragement to you as it has been to me. 
as I have prepared this message before the Lord. So again, Philippians 1, and let me place this in context as we get there. The latter part of this book, uh, it's critical to understand who's writing and where he's writing from and why he is where he is. Most of you know this is the Apostle Paul. This is about 62 AD, which is important to note. It's about 30 years after he came to faith in Christ. It's probably about 34 AD, soon after the resurrection. Paul, a former persecutor of the church, you, you, you might know. He was a jihadist. Think Taliban. He was a persecutor of the church. He encounters Christ. His life is completely changed when he realizes he doesn't have to work. He can't be good enough to attain righteousness. But Christ has come. And as, as a substitute for him, Christ's righteousness now covers him. By faith, he receives it. He's completely changed. And his life has been completely transformed into a new trajectory altogether and to a single purpose, to be conformed to the image of Christ. So Paul is arrested. He gets where he's always wanted to go, to Rome. He gets a free ride to Rome on their dime because he's arrested, taken to Rome. Now he's in prison, house arrest. He's got soldiers that are, that are assigned to him, probably uh, even attached to him, literally chained to him, it seems. And now he's in prison for being the leader of a movement that he sought to crush. This is what God does in our heart. He's gonna get you where he wants you. He's gonna place you where he wants you. And right now, God has put you where he wants you to be a light and you might say, well, Jeff, you don't understand my circumstances. I think I want out. Listen, I'm going to encourage you today. Stay in. Stay in. Stay in. In verse 13, he says, the whole imperial guard has come to, come to understand why he's there. Everybody knows why I'm here. They all know about Jesus now. Every guard that's attached to him. Think about that. They're, they're, they're given you know, a certain time where they're with him and they're, they're trading off. What's Paul going to talk about? to every guard that sits with him for hours on end. You see, Paul says, and this is why he's written the letter. You guys are wondering how I'm doing. I want to encourage you. Rejoice with me. You know I'm in prison, but rejoice because actually the gospel is being propelled into all uh, uh, among Caesar's household even. The latter part of chapter four, he says, hey, and by the way, Caesar's household, they send their greetings too. What? Yeah, they're, yes, they're, they're saying hi to the believers in Philippi. And this is an incredible thing. But listen, it's not because he's all happy, cheery. He, he's, he's not, but he knows this. I've got a new purpose. I'm being conformed into the image of Christ. So celebrate with me. And then he passes this word on to us, to me and to you today. He's saying some have mixed mo uh, motives there in verse 18, sharing Christ because, because that's all God has. Or broken, flawed people, imperfect people like me, that's all he's got. And, but he says, whether by pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed and I rejoice in that. And that word rejoice is the verb form of the word joy. And Paul uses it over and over and over again. While he's in prison. Now, if you're like me, you're tired. I'm tired. I have some days better than other days. And these days, tired of this virus, tired of everybody's opinion about all that, how it ought to go down and this and that. And everybody's got an opinion, contrary opinions, the division, the weight of it all. I'm not talking about in our church. I'm talking about I'm talking about in the world and it is constant. And we wonder when our collective challenges will end. I've got news for you. They will not. Ha, but in this we rejoice. Christ is still conforming us into his image. And so now as a disciple of Christ, you can say, here, here's, here it is if you take notes, because I have my new purpose now. And I want each of these points that I'm going to make today be a declaration for you, a declaration for me. The first thing I want you to see, because I have a new purpose, I can shine with courage. Look at verse 19. Paul's optimism shines through. His courage is not the absence of fear. It's the presence of Christ in his life. Look at what he says in verse 19. For I know 
that through your prayers, now he's assuming they're praying for him, just as we have been praying in our church of prayer, and the help of the spirit of Jesus Christ, notice the spirit, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. I won't be put to shame, but that with full courage, there's the word, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. And here it is, verse 21, perhaps you've heard this one. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul says, I cannot lose. If I'm alive, it's Christ. If I die, it's Christ. Whatever I go through, it's Christ. Friends, listen, if you're in Christ, if your purpose is to be conformed to the image of Christ, remember this today, if I breathe, it's Christ. If I wake up, Christ. If I go to work, it's Christ. If I go to school, it's Christ. Whatever I face, to live is Christ. This may sound strange. To live is Christ. And yet, not so strange. You maybe have seen this. Maybe your kid has a shirt. Maybe you do. Um, ball is life, right? Um, soccer is life. I mean, we understand what he said. S- music is life. It's our thing, right? It's what gets me going. But this is so far beyond anything in this life. Paul says, if I'm alive, it's all about Jesus. In fact, he says, I've been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who rescued me, who gave himself for me. All of life is a response to what Christ has done for us. My entire life is a response to what he's done. I've been listening to pastors this week uh, in Afghanistan, which by the way, second fastest growing church in the world in Afghanistan. You know what the first one is? We've talked about this. Iran. Places where there is extreme persecution and the church is on fire. Jesus said this would be the case. Why is this? Why is persecution a fuel for the advancement of the gospel? It's what Paul's talking about here in in micro form, but for each of us. Whatever we walk through, whatever we face, you you see our purpose is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so if that's my purpose, then whatever comes my way, even if you persecute me in my response and the way I press on, persevere, continue on to be faithful to him, being conformed to his image, I can shine with courage and others take notes. Others see that and say, this is something else. I have no purpose in my life other than my own purpose. This is something else. What this person is walking through, what they're saying and how they're pressing through this, something else is going on. And so others come to faith in Christ because of the way that we walk through challenges. I can persevere. I can shine with courage. Full courage is what Paul says. As I face challenges in my life and not only that I can stay put with conviction I can stay put for the sake of others and to the glory of Christ I can stay in friends listen this is a word for many of us today this is a word for many people I'm talking to many people this week I've had conversations of many who are are just about to give up I've talked to some who have given up and my word for us today the word of God for you the encouragement don't give up don't give up Continue to press on, stay in, because just sometimes the staying in is what brings glory to God. Your perseverance is what brings glory to him. This is what Paul is saying to us here. And it's the word of God telling us in our collective struggles, whatever circumstances come our way, we stay in and and we bring glory to God. Look at verse 22. If, If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, but for that, that is far better, he says. Now this sounds strange to us. And the younger you are, the more strange this is, the stranger this is. He's torn between life and death because he knows that death is life. 
If I live, it's Christ. If I die, it's more Christ. I can't lose. So I will press on with courage. I will stay put with conviction. I'm going to remain right where God has placed me. Paul is living with the end in sight. I'm staying put. I'm staying here. But look, where is here? It's with Christ. It's in Christ. And yes, it's wherever he has placed you. Look, like me, many of us are tired. You're wondering if what you're doing matters. You're wondering if your perseverance, just staying in, just right where you are, is really making a difference. Living out my purpose means that adversity is a manifestation of my discipleship. That I'm becoming like him. I'm becoming more like Jesus. That's the purpose. Our circumstances do not determine our success. The presence of Christ in us does. Brothers and sisters, listen, do not give up. Don't give up. Stay in. If not for you, for everybody else around you. And some of you might think, well, I don't have a whole lot of people around me. Listen, others are watching. I was able to tell one of our senior adults this morning. I said, I know what you're facing. And your life is an inspiration to me. Because you're staying in. He's here with a walker coming to church and praising God. And I'm saying, you are inspiring me, bringing glory to God. You're drawing me to him. Friends, that's what we do when we stay in. Look at verse 24. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He's saying, okay, here's what tips the scales. I, I could go on and be with Jesus now, all the better. But I'm gonna stay in. And some of you need to hear this. I'm gonna stay in, in the flesh. I'm gonna remain right where I am because it's for the good of others around me. Verse 25, convinced of this. He's convinced. He's staying put with conviction. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. He's saying this is about you. This is not about me. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Now he is noting, I'm hopeful to come again. I want to see you again. And Paul will not. We know what happens to him. He will ultimately be executed. But he's saying this. Even if I don't come and see you, we're all in this together. We're pursuing Christ together. We're going to remain in, in God's will, whether it's here, whether it's there, wherever we are, we're going to pursue him and we're going to do it together. We're going to do it as one body because look, I can shine with courage. I can stay put with conviction and I can strive in community. God has not called this, us to this new purpose alone. He's called us to do it together. Look at verse 27. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Okay, so live a holy life. Set apart. This is how you point people to me. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you. That you are standing firm in one spirit. Here it is. One spirit. One mind. Striving. There's the word. Side by side. I love that phrase. For the faith of the gospel key to this new purpose that God has given you is that we do this together. We do it in community, common union with one another. Think about it. We're all not conform. It's, it's not about uniformity. It's about unity. Uniformity would say everybody's like me. Everybody looks like me. Same skin color, same perspective, same, you believe all the exact same things. Nobody differs from me. That's uniformity. This is not what he's talking about. Scripture teaches us diversity in unity, everyone not being the same, but everyone different moving in the same direction. Where's that direction? To Christ. To be conformed into his image collectively. Where else does this happen in the world? I would hope it happens in your home, in relationships, but it happens in the church. This is why we are here side by side, pushing one another on. And I must say, I'm gonna pause and just say this. Not in my notes, but I just want to encourage you all. I'm talking about everybody who's here. There's different reasons. Some of you are watching online and, and we're grateful that you're with us. But it's, it's time for us to commit to being together in the body of Christ. And some of us, we're, we're still uh, fearful, uh, uh, have health issues and such, and we don't want to get, we have people who don't come because we're not certain everybody's going to wear a mask. We have others who probably are, y'all are wearing masks, I'm not coming. 
Friends, it's time for us all to commit to, to being together as you are. I'm preaching to the choir. Way to go. Way to be here. Be here next week. Let's keep pressing on. Look at verse 28 as we close. And not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. He's saying, hey, when you follow Christ, if you're continuing to be conformed into his image, then you're gonna see, your enemies will know what you're up against. I don't know who your opponents, who the enemies are in your life, where that might be, but it's those who are seeking to crush or push back the truth of God and what he's doing in the world. They know what they're up against. Their defeat, our victory. As we continue to press on, as I live out my new purpose, I can shine with courage, I can stay put with conviction, I can strive in community, finally, I can suffer with confidence. Not only do we trust in him, we also suffer for him. Look at verse 29. For it has been granted to me. That word granted means uh, a gracious gift. Think about this. A gracious, loving gift. That for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him. Okay, we're able to trust in him. But it is a gracious gift to suffer for him. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. See, here's the thing. When we walk through opposition, when we go through suffering, people look at us and they see that that our goal is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And he does this most beautifully through our challenging circumstances. See, when we walk through suffering, it means that my new purpose is, is that my, my circumstances are catalysts, not constraints. They're catalysts for change. And, and with my new purpose, it means that my joy, and this is where people see it. This is how they're drawn to Christ. My joy is not circumstantial. This will happen only when I go through challenging seasons, right? Go through a hard season. My joy is not circumstantial. It's consequential. It's based on what Christ has already accomplished me. Christ in me doing his work. I know where my life is heading. I know what my purpose is. And it's to become like Jesus. Because someday I'm going to see him face to face. And his work that he began in me, in you, will be completed. In Colossians 3, it says, when Christ, who is your life, is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Jesus Christ is the way. He is the truth. He is life. And he's calling everyone who hears my voice right now to him, to give your life completely to him. Let this be a day. Let it be a declaration that you say, I am all in. I'm not giving up. I decide today that my new purpose will be fulfilled. I want to be conformed into the image of Christ. That's why I'm here. Praise be to God. He will finish what he has started. And in Philippians 1.21, let's close this message by saying this all together. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word, how powerful it is in our lives. And we thank you that we're encouraged by it today. And Lord, I pray that you will work in all of us to, Lord, help me. What an encouragement it's been this week for you to remind me, Lord, do it again today. Do it again tomorrow, every minute. Your purpose in my life is to be conformed into your image. That changes everything. And so, Lord, keep that at the forefront of our minds. And when we walk through challenging seasons and and, and moments, they will come this week. They will come today. We're going to see how you're conforming us into your image and we will rejoice. Thank you for your love today. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for this work that you have started in us and you will complete it. It gives us hope that we will see you face to face. And when we do, we'll be completely transformed and your work in us will be accomplished. Until then, we will trust you. We will abide in you and we will love others to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.